I'll talk about uh, tax havens and also the issue of uh, tax avoidance more generally. And um, I guess sort of one semantic clarification is probably important at the outset, which is the difference between tax evasion and tax avoidance. Um, so tax evasion basically uh, entails the sort of not paying taxes in a way that violates the law. And often when you see um, uh, tax protests and, and other things, you're, you're talking about tax evasion, or, t or tax evasion might be sort of taking a cash payment and not declaring it. Um, uh, tax avoidance is, uh, tax avoidance basically uh, involves using legal means uh, that are available to uh, avoid the, the tax burden. Um, and I think tax avoidance is actually the much uh, more significant issue, and, uh, and so that's what I'll focus on. Um, so I think the story of um, tax havens uh, as sort of a, the modern issue that we face today, I would trace it um, to sort of after the Civil War, and, and that's not to diminish, obviously, the U.S. founding, which was in many ways uh, sort of born out of a, a tax rebellion, and I think the the frontier experience in the U.S. was a form of a, a tax haven. But I think um, I think if you look at sort of the U.S. and, and its economic development in the aftermath of the Civil War, uh, particularly beginning in the 1870s, uh, you see just a massive uh, accumulation of, of wealth in the U.S. and and a project of state and nation building, which basically, uh, within a relatively short period of time, uh, just led to a really remarkable accumulation of family wealth uh, in the U.S. So since the 1870s, uh, the U.S. experienced a sevenfold growth in real capita income, which carried through the 20th century. Sort of wealthy people and, and wealthy families in particular um, began to use international tax havens uh, during the interwar years. This was obviously uh, after the income tax had been uh, established. And, um, and so you see the very early uh, stages here of wealthy families and, and corporate dynasties and whatnot beginning to take advantage of, of tax havens. Um, the first sort of uh, government report or, or sort of president to really look at this issue, at least that I found, uh, was in a 1937 report uh, to President Roosevelt by Treasury Secretary uh, Henry Morgenthau, and he, he basically wrote this memo to Roosevelt implicating uh, a number of wealthy industrialists, such as the, the Mellon and DuPont families, and, um, and he sort of pointed to the fact that they were using tax havens uh, at the time in the Bahamas, which we'll talk about later, Panama and Newfoundland were, were the three big ones, and, and Newfoundland will also become interesting. I have to say, I, I didn't get too much into the um, the charitable side, although I think that was probably a factor, and I and I and I think that's right too. I didn't look too much onto the smuggling side, but I suspect that you were at this period looking much more at tax evasion uh, than tax avoidance as a, a strategy for for minimizing taxes. Um, the, you know, the interesting thing, and, and this came as a surprise to me when I was doing the research, is I would have expected a major jump in, in tax avoidance after the 1940s when the U.S. began to impose uh, serious taxes on the wealthy. Um, and I mean, when you look at sort of the 1950s into the early 1960s, you, there, there was a point where the federal income tax was uh, over 90 percent, the, the very top tax bracket. And, and yet well, the interesting thing is that even during this period, you, you didn't really see a lot of um, tax avoidance or use of international tax havens that you do uh, later on. And, and you know, you had a, a handful of cases, but when they happened, they really generated headlines. Um, so probably the most sort of famous case was John Templeton, and he renounced his citizenship in 1962 and uh, basically fled to the Bahamas, and he ended up saving about $100 million, which is part of why he was able to become such a notable philanthropist. Um, 
But but even the term tax haven was uh, very rarely used uh, before the 1950s. And I mean, I found a, a 1961 report in the New York Times, um, and and they were I think it was in the context of John Templeton. But but the report basically said, you know, quote. Relatively few U.S. citizens are uh, attempting to avoid all taxes on business profits through the use of, of tax havens, and and so it's sort of an interesting question why. And I'm I'm curious about what theories you have, but I think the big one that I sort of came across was, um, and this is I think a, a relative paradox in the U.S. But on the one hand, we have this unique anti-tax history and tradition, but on the other hand, the U.S. is sort of an outlier um, in the degree to which it, it has maintained uh, what's called in the literature tax morale. Um, and, and basically, a tax morale is sort of a measure of uh, how willing Americans are just voluntarily to, to pay their taxes. And, and tax morale tends, I think, to, to be sort of a proxy for Basically, how uh, how Americans perceive how how trustworthy and competent Americans perceive uh, the government to be, um, and and law professors sort of basically what it boils down to is Americans or, or people of any country sort of pay their taxes on a quasi voluntary basis when they feel that uh, they're not being taken advantage of, and I think that theory has a lot of explanatory power. Uh, in the sense that during this period in the 50s and 60s, when you had a, a very high tax rate, um, three in four Americans uh, told pollsters that they they trusted the government to to do what is right, either most of the time or, or just about always. It's sort of easy to forget just how dominant the U.S. was at this time, and um, and I mean how unattractive the the rest of the world was uh, during this period as well. So I think that's probably the other other big reason. Um, I think I think things begin to to change sort of by the late sixties into the seventies and and what I think happens here is um, probably the biggest thing is that what you have with the between the civil rights movement and, and I, I would argue actually even more significantly um, with the Hart Seller Act in the nineteen sixties, which opens up the door to uh, highly educated uh, immigrants from from outside the West is that the the character of American wealth uh, really begins to change, and I think um, I think what you have is is two big things happening. One is that uh, these sort of uh, long established areas in the country that have that, that had acquired a great deal of intergenerational wealth were uh, all of a sudden sort of facing a a significant challenge to their dominance. In, in the 19th century, much of this wealth was concentrated in, in the Boston area, the Boston elite, and then sort of into the 20th century, it became more concentrated in um, a lot of the Episcopalian establishments in, in New York and Philadelphia. And the, you know, the recipe in large part in both of these areas was that these were sort of communities that really acquired a great deal of social clout and, and political and economic clout by, by laying down roots in a particular area uh, and, and sort of building wealth outward and sort of tax havens and, and tax avoidance considerably more complicated because their wealth was tied to sort of uh, the broader social capital that they, they had acquired in a particular place. Um, with what you see happening here with with the arrival of sort of immigrants from all over the world um, beginning sort of in the late sixties and into the seventies um, is one that you now have this sort of new mobile class of of people who are wealthy who don 't have the same historic or, or cultural ties to the u s and this becomes very important when you get into the the eighties and the nineties. The eighties are very significant here because what ends up happening here is basically that you have Sort of two two big things that that sort of coincide with each other. You have this sort of uh, new immigrant class that that's kind of laying down, that that's assimilating into the country and and kind of poised for for economic prominence. You have sort of the the Reagan era where where there's a, a major tax cut, a major deregulation and liberalization of the high financial sector, um, and. Th- this is sort of a, a very significant development that happens, and and by the early '80s, uh, all of a sudden you see 
this explosion and the rise of offshore financial centers. And, and one scholar sort of goes as far as to say that tax havens by the early 80s uh, become the, the heart of globalization. And what you, what you start to see here is basically these offshore financial centers, um, are, they're being used predominantly for, for the purpose of, of avoiding taxes. The, this trend, which sort of begins on Wall Street and in high finance, really just goes even further into the 90s, where you then see the rise of the uh, tech sector, um, which is another major development here in, in creating this new sort of immigrant transnational class of wealth with, with sort of a, like high finance, but technology is just inherently a much more sort of globalizing and globalized form of, of wealth. What, what, you, what this eventually sort of culminates in is... Um, that you have immigrant populations uh, just sort of acquiring enormous amounts of wealth uh, at sort of relative to uh, older, sort of more established uh, networks in the U.S. That, that are wealthy. And so you have sort of, you know, one example to illustrate that would be uh, if you look at public venture funded companies before 1980, it was about 7% that were founded by immigrants um, by, by the mid-2000s the number goes up to, to a third of them. On the corporate side, too, you see uh, a major change here in, in tax havens, too. And um, I didn't look as much into the corporate side of it, but I, I did look a great deal into the insurance industry, which kind of epitomizes this sort of trend in, in corporate use of tax havens. Um, so, like in the case of the insurance industry, what ends up happening is that Bermuda eliminates it, its direct corporate taxes uh, in 1966, but after the the 86 tax reform, um, for a variety of complicated reasons, basically this sort of phenomenon of corporate inversions uh, takes hold, and and so I think this was largely sort of inadvertent. On if you look at the tax debate, um, but within a few decades, you see sort of U.S. based insurers. Uh, go from uh, uh, making up about 85% of the American insurance market, and that goes down to 27%, where basically these American companies are using sort of tax loopholes and things like that and, and relocating to Bermuda uh, and, and then basically sort of uh, saving taxes. And, and so by, you know, 15%, in 1989, you had 15% of, of top insurers uh, were, were American, or sorry, we're foreign, and that number jumps to 60% um, w within a few years. The Puerto Rico thing is a, a more recent development, and I, I was going to actually get there toward the end. Um, I, I didn't follow too much the development of Puerto Rico, but I think it, it's become a more significant uh, thing more in, in more recent years. Um, but, but Bermuda was really the big one that, that took hold uh, after the, the Reagan tax cuts in the 80s. So, so it's really, you know, my sense was that basically that a lot of these uh, deregulation and, and liberalization in the 80s, um, it sort of happened with, um, with very few people anticipating that the degree to which it would really fuel uh, uh, the, the use of, of tax havens and, and tax avoidance. But, but by the, the 1990s, um, it becomes clear that this is sort of a a challenge and and so uh, as Treasury Secretary Larry Summers sort of pointed out, uh, kind of noted a uh, public statement he called a uh, corporate tax shelter as quote the most serious compliance issue uh, threatening the American tax system. The the interesting thing though is that sort of Summers says this, but it it really takes until the Obama administration in in I mean, two decades later uh, for there to be any real uh, legislative action. Uh, to to try to deal with this issue, and so uh, at the G20 summit in April 2009, um, world leaders sort of called for an end to bank secrecy, and and Obama built on that and, and signed into law um, the Foreign Account Tax Compliance Act, uh, FATCA. You know, it's, it's this complicated piece of legislation. Uh, Stephen, maybe you know more about this than I do, but but it basically sort of threatens foreign financial institutions with a 30% withholding rate if they fail to report uh, information on asset holders or basically people using tax havens for you know, for taxes. But uh, so, so what I think starts to happen is the 
Uh, on the one hand, the sort of trend continues where you have this, uh, again, massive explosion of wealth in the U.S. in the 80s and 90s. Um, you have this changing character of, of American wealth creation and family wealth. Um, and especially, I think, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, you're now presented with this sort of situation where the U.S. is just this dominant um, economic and, and political sector um, for for wealthy people. And I, I pulled together uh, just some, some data to kind of illustrate just how, how dominant the U.S. was in, in this high wealth area. So, I mean, basically the U.S. sort of by the late 90s ends up becoming owning sort of a third of the world's wealth, um, gen- generates 41% of the world's millionaires, 50% of the world's high net worth or ultra high net worth individuals. These are 50 million plus. Uh, and 30% of the world's billionaires. Um, so again, just like an enormous amount of money that's concentrated here in the U.S. And um, and so what, what this creates basically, especially after the Cold War, is now a new uh, major opportunity for, for other countries, which is that if they can uh, implement sort of a low-tax regime or a, a generally a f- friendly regime and create the basic... Um, infrastructure and institutions to draw capital flight, that this can be a major uh, growth of revenue and source of revenue. And and I think unlike sort of in the 50s and 60s, the uh, ease with which money can flow and capital can flow uh, is also uh, changing qu- quite dramatically, uh, which makes it sort of more difficult for, for governments to really monitor and regulate how this is happening. You know, another thing here too, and I think I think it's important is that uh, ideology ha- has a lot to do with this phenomenon, and I think um, through the sensibilities of this new uh, generation of wealth that's produced in the '80s and '90s, um, it is very different from from an older uh, generation of, of wealthy Americans, and I think they're they're distinguished sort of um, culturally and so forth. They're, I think they're just oriented much more in a globalizing uh, global economy. And, um, and and probably the best book that I came across on the subject is by uh, Parag Khanna. Um, he, he wrote a book a few years ago. It's called Connectography, Mapping the Future of Global Civilization. And he talks about how we've sort of developed this new economy where you know, the, the, the buzzword that he uh, uses is connectivity, and he says that that connectivity basically has become sort of like liberty or capitalism. He calls it a, a world historical idea, um, and and it's one that that in his word is words is reengineering the planet to facilitate surging flows of people, commodities, goods, data, and capital. Um, and and so basically, you know, the, these are people uh, who are creating fortunes that are based uh, on on really addressing market needs more so than heritage or history. Um, they're, they're, net le- they're much less nationalistic. They just owe much less to any particular area. Uh, and so a lot of the ideological, I think, uh, boundaries or, or obstacles that might have presented sort of a challenge to an earlier generation of wealthy people are, are just start to go away, um, which, which I think facilitates further uh, the use of, of tax havens. So, so I think the next um, the next kind of phase of this issue uh, really happens after uh, in the wake of the financial crisis, where sort of trends toward income inequality, which were already happening, uh, just sort of escalate even further. Um, and and sort of Citigroup had had prepared a, a report in two thousand five, which became sort of doubly prescient, I think, after. Uh, the financial crisis, and it basically said that the world's wealthy countries, uh, namely the U.S., uh, U.K., Canada, and others, uh, are, had become what are called plutonomies, um, and which are defined as states where, where quote economic growth is powered by and largely consumed by uh, the wealthy few, and um, and so Citigroup kind of predicted and, and predicted correctly that basically. Uh, this this trend toward plutonomy would continue to swell from uh, what they called globalized enclaves, and these were again just places with uh, competitive uh, 
tax uh, structures that were conducive to sort of the the needs and interests of ultra high net worth uh, individuals that are you know ba- basically they're they're now growing at a rate of about 6.5% of total global wealth uh and and households that are on, that, that have more than a million dollars in private wealth um according to current trends are on track to acquiring about half of total global wealth by uh 2021 um Another way to measure this sort of enormous inequality would be uh, in terms of consumer spending. So you have basically the top 10% of earners uh, are responsible for about 22% of consumer spending, which is the same as the bottom 50%. Um, so you basically now, especially after the financial crisis, have this exceedingly small number of, of wealthy people that are really dictating the terms uh, of economic and consumer trends. And... And what you start to see is really a diversification of wealth uh, internationally, whether it's sort of in the luxury property market uh, or in terms of investments or or other things, all of which basically, uh, again, is sort of facilitating the use of of, uh, international tax havens. So so what I think what what really ends up happening, especially after the financial crisis, where you have all of a sudden this sort of explosion of uh, very wealthy people, um, sort of with their own prerogatives and so forth, is a new sort of industry really begins to develop and mature that that's based around uh, transnational succession planning, and basically, these are sort of it's this whole industry of of people sort of who manage family offices and um, you know have have lawyers and and consultants and others who are in the business really of just helping these very high net worth people. Uh, to preserve their wealth across generations, and 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 it seems like sort of the the one of the most significant ways people are doing that is by taking advantage of these smaller countries that are using tax havens as a development model, um, and and basically sort of these high net worth people are diversifying by getting what what are called the passport portfolio. So they're basically acquiring uh, uh, second or third passports. Uh, they're taking advantage of sort of residency and investment incentives in other countries, and they're just sort of using these mechanisms, uh, almost all of which are legal, um, to to orchestrate sort of a uh, an entire legal uh, a way of tax avoidance. And all of these things are are being done in such a sophisticated way that basically they're outpacing what what the government, what the IRS can. Uh, reasonably sort of hope to accomplish and uh, in, in terms of tax enforcement. And so even with FATCA and other uh, regulations, you're just not seeing sort of a commensurate uh, increase in, in uh, revenues being gained from or, or any significant sort of a crackdown on, on tax havens or tax avoidance. So between 2008 and 2016, uh, the number of Americans renouncing their citizenship or terminating their long-term residency jumped by over 2,000 percent. Probably the most notable people are uh, Tina Turner, who went to Switzerland, a number of Bitcoin uh, investors, uh, and uh, Eduardo Saverin was another, probably the most high-profile case. He ended up moving to Singapore. And, and so, like, the State Department in 2014 raised the fee uh, for renouncing U.S. citizenship by over 400 percent. But, but you know, this fee and other kind of regulations, it just doesn't, it, it's not enough to really prevent this overall trend toward greater diversification and the use of, of tax havens. Um, probably the biggest winners in, in the sort of wealth exodus and this use of tax havens have been a uh, small number of countries that are really taking advantage of this as a development strategy. And, and it's quite interesting, uh, the countries that are, are doing this. It, it's not necessarily intuitive. Um, but you have sort of uh, Luxembourg is a big one. Um, Hong Kong and Singapore have taken advantage of this. Um, you have these sort of random obscure places like the Cook Islands, um, which are using different international treaties and so forth. Um, Switzerland, uh, to some degree, although it's it's losing its edge with the, the elimination of bank secrecy, 
Um, and probably as a category, the biggest winners here have been sort of former British territories. And, and the reason why they're well positioned is because they benefit from these colonial legal systems. So they have sort of the, the basic infrastructure to manage large flows of money coming in. Uh, but they also have a great deal of autonomy uh, to set low taxes and sort of attract a new, uh, attract this new money coming in. Um, so I guess like the, maybe just by, and I get, well, so, so to continue kind of the, uh, the ideological dimension of this, I think what, what begins to change sort of after the financial crisis, especially is that in the eighties and nineties, as sort of an ideological phenomenon, I think globalization is the big, um, it's a big sort of buzzword or ideological trend that's fueling the use of tax havens. I think when you get after the financial crisis, um, you're you're looking at something different. I think, which is related but different, which is that uh, among the people who are really involved with sort of utilizing tax havens, you're seeing that um, it's kind of U.S. boundaries and and nationalistic considerations that might have been sort of encumbered an older generation of Americans uh, or well, or wealthy people generally. Uh, are not there. So, in a, I, I came across this uh, book. It's written by a historian somewhere in Europe. It's called Capital Without Borders, Wealth Managers and the 1%. And, and it's the first book to really look at this industry uh, of wealth management. And so she conducted a bunch of interviews and just sort of tried to figure out who these people are. And and she she found that basically what, what the defining trend here is that, uh, quote, the stateless super rich themselves cannot be prevailed upon to pay taxes. Um, why? Because, uh, quote, they, they belong nowhere in particular and can move at will. Ideological appeals to patriotism or civic duty are meaningless. And she defines the, sort of this wealth management thing as they're almost this sort of ethos that where, where their primary loyalty is to these very wealthy people who want to move their money around, have all these prerogatives, uh, that may or may not necessarily be tied to the interests of, of the nation states where they're from. And then you also see sort of you know, other tech, technologies coming about that, that offer new mechanisms of tax avoidance. Uh, cryptocurrencies, I think, being the big one, but I think even other uh, just computers and, and other means of moving money around that are just very hard to trace. All of which I think epitomizes just sort of a, a broader lack of trust in government. So from a high of 77% in, in 1964, um, today polls show that trust in government has plummeted to around 20%. And, um, and you see this in particular uh, among the wealthy. So like during the late 2000s, uh, when the individual tax rate was 35%, two-thirds of Americans earning 250000 or more uh, felt that they were overburdened with taxes. And and it was really this demographic that was the only income group that believed that the U.S. tax system uh, was unfair. One thing, actually, I should have noted on in terms of countries that are taking advantage of um, tax havens, uh, oddly enough, Canada is really becoming uh, sort of taking steps to draw capital flight uh, from the U.S. and other places. And um, and even though their overall taxes are are higher than the U.S., um, they've they've implemented a new program to draw uh, high net worth individuals. Um, and basically, they've they've implemented this new regime where um, they don't impose any estate or gift taxes uh, for wealthy families during their first five years of residency in Canada. They don't have the same sort of disclosure laws on family offices, um, and so. Places like Vancouver uh, are, are really becoming sort of like uh, Hong Kong and Singapore and uh, St. Kitts, a, a major tax haven. And so it's not necessarily these remote uh, countries outside of the West that are, are taking advantage of this. You know, I guess the big, the big question here is, so, so where, where does this go from here? Because I, I guess the way I, I see it is that you have, on, you have these sort of colliding trends, which is on the one hand... But I think income inequality is, is sort of the, uh, the big challenge of the day. And I think you, you have uh, increasingly sort of a consensus in both parties uh, 
uh, that, that makes it harder in some ways to cut taxes on individuals, even if, even though we've gotten this corporate rate down. Um, but on the other hand, we have all these sort of economic trends that, that point to greater uh, use of tax havens and, and tax competitions. And so uh, I guess I would, I'd be curious sort of what, what you guys think the, the future is of this. Um, you know, will tax havens continue to exist? Will we see a crackdown? Can there be a crackdown? Or, or what does the world order look like where increasingly sort of a, the wealthy just have options and, and paying taxes increasingly becomes sort of a, a voluntary thing to do? If you look at the countries that are drawing uh, the most families coming here, um, it's a very random and diverse array of countries. It, it includes China, South Korea, the UAE, and Iran, in addition to kind of the U.S. and other major European countries. And so I, I think that's exactly right, that you're getting these families that are basically, more than anything, seeking to preserve their wealth. And if you look at... Um, it's causing a great deal of tension, especially in places like Vancouver, uh, where you basically have these sort of foreign wealthy people. They're coming here to take advantage of this regime for, for five years uh, just to kind of establish residency, but they have no ties to the place. Um, and it, it's unclear how sustainable of, a, of an arrangement this will be, it, which is kind of a, a different approach than that what a Taiwan took, where sort of Taiwan was experiencing, has been experiencing a lot of capital flight going to Singapore and Hong Kong. So they basically uh, j just recently ended up cutting their uh, top inheritance tax rate from 50% to 10%, uh, which strikes me as being a more sort of enduring, sustainable way of actually drawing productive people to the country. Um, and, and, and that's also a, a particularly wise policy, I think, because even if they can never get their tax rates down to what St. Kitts or some of these smaller random island nations can do, um, there is just so much infrastructure there and, and other advantages that, that can draw people that these smaller islands can, can never really do or, or won't be able to do for a long time. Um, on, the, on the Puerto Rico question, uh, so I, I don't actually know how, um, how this works for, for bigger corporations, but um, the reason why Puerto Rico is becoming more important in this is that basically... When, when, as an individual, you're trying to uh, bring down your taxes and do so in a way that allows you to be in the U.S. for as long as possible, uh, Puerto Rico becomes really attractive because what, what you basically end up having to do is you first have to get your in, income streams to be uh, largely location independent, which is relatively easy to do for two categories of people. One is just very high net worth individuals who are making their money off of investments. And then the other is sort of this newer crowd of entrepreneurs who are making money online or whatever else. Um, and basically where Puerto Rico fits in is that in order, I mean, short of renouncing U.S. citizenship, there are basically two things you can do. You, you can live outside of the U.S. for 330 days uh, to qualify for the foreign earned income exclusion. And that eliminates your tax burden on the first hundred two thousand of of income, um, but then the question becomes sort of what you do after that. And um, you can either basically bounce around country to country before your tourist visa expires, uh, or what what you can do is basically establish residency in Puerto Rico. And if you if you establish residency in Puerto Rico, all you basically have to do is buy an apartment there, rent it out, and then you can. You, know, you can sort of live, quote unquote, live there, but in, in reality, go wherever you want. And, and so that's Puerto Rico is probably the cheapest way and the most efficient way to uh, set up your financial base without really being restricted in terms of how much time you can spend in the U.S. Uh, or wherever you want. And then Puerto Rico also offers an advantage in that the, the way you can avoid social security taxes is by setting up an offshore corporation. And, and when you set up an offshore corporation, you end up getting exempted from social security taxes. So you basically then just pay yourself out of the corporation and uh, the rest of the money that you owe gets deferred uh, until you sell the company. So you get to invest that money instead of paying taxes. Um, 
and and banking and setting up a corporation in Puerto Rico is just much easier to do than in a lot of other countries. But I don't. That's about the extent to which I know how Puerto Rico fits into this. My my sense was that basically the there are kind of two big takeaways that I got from FATCA. Um, in terms of sort of the actual impact, um, revenue projections did not predict any significant effect on FATCA. But what I think happened is that basically FATCA was sort of a probably the most significant indicator uh, that the U.S. government and also major world leaders were actually ready to do something about this uh, tax avoidance issue. And, and I think that's become doubly true after uh, the Panama Papers and, and other high profile journalistic reports. And so I think like, I think a lot of people still, when they, when they hear about tax havens or tax avoidance, they think about like secret Swiss bank accounts or whatever. But I think what fat guys really done is expedite a trend that I think was happening anyway, which is that if you're, if you're trying to basically lower your tax rate as much as possible, it increasingly makes uh, absolutely no sense to do it illegally. I mean, I think the only people who are really doing large-scale uh, tax evasion are either like people who are just operating in the cash economy or maybe in the cryptocurrency world or obviously in illicit markets. But if you're, you know, if you're someone who's making your money legitimately, in, in, an, old, in an earlier time, you might have opened up sort of a secret bank account in Switzerland or something, but it just it's virtually impossible to do that today. And insofar as it is possible, the risk reward of it almost never adds up, and and the opportunities and and incentives to do it legally um, are just far more compelling. So that was my big takeaway from from FATCA, but I I imagine Clarkson and others know more about this uh, than I do. Yeah, I mean, I on on FATCA, I think that um, I I I basically you know, Stephen's comments are are consistent with with what I found, which is basically that you know FATCA doesn't do a whole lot to change sort of the the underlying um, incentive structure facing people who want to use this offshore strategy, but it does just create uh, a lot of complications in terms of actually implementing it because it makes. Um, American money just a much more onerous challenge for foreign banks, many of whom either can't do it or, or won't deal with it. And um, it had a big impact, uh, as Stephen mentioned, on Switzerland. Um, and and I think generally it just makes sort of um, bank secrecy uh, a, a very difficult uh, thing to implement uh, in practice. I mean, you know, the Puerto Rico thing, I, uh, Stephen's comments also point to sort of an issue that I uh, I was curious what your thoughts were, but I, you know, this was sort of a big question and a paradox that I came across, which is that you have on the one hand sort of every trend, every incentive uh, moving in the direction of greater uh, tax havens. You have sort of this um, high degrees of inequality, um, wealth being created in ways that aren't tied to a particular area, um, different ideologies emerging that are sort of uh, not as tied to nationalistic uh, uh, considerations, um, new countries developing uh, that that sort of use uh, capital flight as as a development strategy, and and uh, all of this is certainly leading to a, a pretty significant increase in the use of tax havens and also of people that, as a percentage renouncing their American citizenship, and yet I, I think it has to be said that the overall number of people who are resorting to tax havens and, and who are renouncing their U.S. citizenship is, is still very, very low. Um, and, I, and I think probably, you know, with these new tax cuts, I mean, I think that's probably going to staunch that trend uh, even further, given the new competitiveness that, that, that will be brought about on the corporate side. And, and so, like, the question is why, and I think uh, at least the answer that I sort of came to, uh, I think, was in many ways what Stephen alluded to, which is that you, you know, even even these places like Puerto Rico or like the Cook Islands or like St. Kitts or whatever else, or even, even when you're talking about um, Taiwan or Singapore or places like that, um, as competitive as their sort of uh, tax incentives are, they just aren't really the places where, where people want to move to. Um, and so if you look at where sort of how people are 
the wealthy are diversifying. Uh, yes, they are sort of opening bank accounts. Yes, they are getting new passports. But if you look at like the real estate market, um, a lot of this money is going to these mega cities in, in Europe and, and other places that are not anyone's idea of being competitive in terms of taxes. And, and the other thing, too, is that despite sort of the fact that there are any number of places in the world that you can go with a lower tax rate, you know, if you're looking to make a lot of money and if you're looking to be a part of the, these places that are producing and generating wealth, I mean, as Charlie mentioned, um, the U.S. still remains sort of a, a highly competitive place. Uh, there, there's really nothing like it in the world. And, and even if you have a relatively high tolerance for sort of leaving your place of origin and just pursuing different tax structures and whatnot, um, it's just really hard to do. There, there are a lot of major legacy advantages that the U.S. and Canada and the Western world have uh, that make it very hard to, to draw capital flight, even with a, a competitive tax structure. And I guess I'd be, I'd be curious sort of what your thoughts are. I mean, is, you know, is this sort of an enduring trend where, where countries like the U.S. can get away with having a higher taxes than the rest of the world and, and get away with it because of all the other cultural and legal and legacy advantages that we have, or are we going to see sort of an accelerated trend of people just starting to actually renounce their citizenship and move abroad and, you know, pursue, pursue tax havens with greater zeal? You know, so after I finished doing the research for these two articles, I mean, one was on tax havens and the other was on intergenerational wealth, I, I mean, I, I looked at these numbers, um, of, of just how few people were taking advantage of this, and, and I was astonished. I mean, I thought, uh, with all these opportunities, like, why wouldn't more people do this? Um, and and what I found is basically that, um, you know, where, where it is happening is, one, in, in this realm of succession planning, uh, and, and there you see a lot of people who have serious amounts of money to pass down. I mean, they are looking at uh, every last option. Um, I think in the realm of uh, sort of online business and sort of online entrepreneurs, you are absolutely seeing people um, move abroad and, and go to these lower tax uh, jurisdictions. And I think if, if crypto uh, becomes an enduring trend, that's probably going to happen more. But, you know, when I looked into it uh, personally, I mean, I was, you know, when I really sort of sat down and did the analysis, um, I realized that, you know, even if you have minimal sort of loyalty to the U.S. and, and nationalistic considerations aren't really pressing, um, it's just like really, really hard to find places in the world that have all the amenities of a, of like a New York or a Washington, D.C., or even like a, a smaller American city. And, um, and, and what I mean by that is just like, you know, when you look at all the things that you want on a day-to-day -day basis and that make life sort of easy uh, to manage, um, the the rest of the world just isn't sort of up to speed, and and th that could be th that could come in the form of sort of being able to transact and and live without learning another language. Uh, it could be sort of just ordering Amazon um, shipments. Um, it could just be like having enough high quality restaurants or, or other things. Um, and so as I sort of made this list of competitive uh, tax places and then really dug into where I could actually live, uh, I mean, the list just ended up getting lower and lower. And, and so obviously, I think people who either want to be wealthy or already have money uh, have sort of different levels of tolerance. But when you really get down to it, um, when you're looking at paying sort of, I mean, I, I, I was persuaded on the one hand that if you're sort of a, a solo entrepreneur and you can get your income streams independent and you're willing to travel and move, I mean, you can very easily get your tax rate down from in the 30s or, or 40s down to under 5%. I mean, there are plenty of people who can do that. But then I think the question you have to answer is, to what end? Like, if you have, um, if you're keeping, let's say, 20% more of your money, but you're now moving, bouncing from country to country every couple months, and you're living in places where English may or may not be spoken, and, you know, you're, you're living in places where even very luxurious apartments and whatnot are in kind of uh, shitty cities, and et cetera, et cetera, um, 
you know, at, at a certain point, like the risk reward just sort of doesn't add up unless, unless you're in it for the adventure and, and there's something about the process itself that, that's really uh, appealing. So, I mean, I guess my own sort of view is personally, I'm, I'm open to doing it, but I've just realized that, that you really have to plan this out properly and accept that, um, that no matter how you do it, there are major costs to leaving the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is just a well-functioning country, and especially if you look at the major urban areas, they, they just like work in a way that the rest of the world doesn't. I guess the question is sort of how long this will be the state of play, and I guess I could see both sides of the argument. On the one hand, if you if you look at even these sort of highly uncompetitive places in Europe, um, they're still miles ahead of the rest of the world just because of how much wealth they've built up over many centuries. But on the other hand, I mean, you know, if a country with a decent infrastructure and whatnot did manage to impose uh, create sort of enough infrastructure, enough rule of law, draw enough of an expat community, and they ju then just really create sort of overwhelming incentives for wealthy people to bring their money and capital, um, you could see sort of mid-sized cities all around the world really become, or, or smaller countries around the world really become appealing places and become very wealthy within a short period of time. So, so do you think getting rid of dual citizenship would, I mean, I could see that going both ways. On the one hand, um, the fact that dual citizenship is allowed makes it attractive just to pay a hundred thousand or whatever it is to buy a, a another passport from another country and use it as sort of a backup tool but i mean if if that option were no longer on the table do you think i, I guess is your view that more wealthy people would ultimately just suck it up and pay the higher taxes and keep their american citizenship or do you are, are you worried that more people would at that point pull the trigger and just leave the country altogether yeah, I mean, so that was my sort of big uh, conclusion as I looked at the the regulatory side of it. That I mean, it seemed to be unquestionably that if if governments are relying on just like actually cracking down on transactions and um, that kind of thing, that it's inherently sort of a, a losing gambit. It seems to me that the by far the most effective way of discouraging this behavior is really, uh, as Stephen's saying, on the reputational side and with a great deal of disclosure. Um, and, and, you know, every time there's a leak of the Panama Papers or whatever else, you know, whatever s sanctions that these people have to pay, it, it, it's just far outweighed um, by the reputational damage that, that it incurs. Um, one one of the quotes from the the Brooke Harrington book that that jumped out at me is, she she was saying that really in the last couple of years this sort of this wealth management industry uh, has has turned into a what she calls a professional jurisdiction, and she's saying it's a jurisdiction that quotes sort of treats national boundaries as a resource to be exploited rather than as a limiting factor. And she says that, that it's sort of guided by, in her words, an ethic reminiscent of medieval knighthood, an aristocratic code dedicated to the cause of defending large concentrations of wealth from attack by outsiders. And so on the one hand, I think you are going to see this wealth management industry continue to grow and professionalize. But I think Stephen's correct that you're going to see a, a major countervailing force where you look at uh, major institutions like banks, law firms, uh, et cetera, that are sort of rooted in, in these in these nation states that have sort of uh, th their whole business model does rely on sort of cooperative relationships with governments and whatnot. And I think it's going to become increasingly uh, politically and, and socially untenable, if not uh, outright illegal, to facilitate uh, this sort of, of behavior. And and that may not matter if, if you're like an online or internet entrepreneur or if you're just day trading all day or whatever. But the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of wealth being created uh, is not in those sectors. It, it still is in um, in industries and, and sectors where, you know, a certain degree of loyalty to a place or ties to a place or friendly relations with, with governments uh, really matters. And so I guess I view it as sort of an arms race, but one that I think in some ways, um, w one in which I don't think governments are by any means uh, helpless in this.
you know, I guess I guess the final thing would be that I, I definitely noted uh, sort of a correlation between use of tax havens and, and sort of degrees of trust in U.S. systems and U.S. government. And right now we're at a relatively low point. Um, I mean, do you think this trust factor can can be turned around? And if it if it does turn around, do you think that's going to affect this tax haven issue at all? Or um, or are these things just sort of going to go in different directions? So, so in other words, like in 10 years or 20 years, are we going to see trust in government go up or down or stay the same? And then if it does go up, is that going to diminish the use of tax havens or, or will it just be a, will, will these things sort of not become tied to each other to the same degree as it has historically? I guess I, I just, I think increasingly these are going to become separate uh, issues. And and I think the reason is because this this trend toward sort of greater, um, I, I just think if you look at all the sectors where where the trends are going in terms of how people make their money and what their options are on taxes, I think we are probably moving more and more to a point where taxation is increasingly going to become a, a voluntary in a way that it hasn't been for a long time. I mean, so as more and more Americans just make their money in online businesses or um, as as more and more of these families just acquire enormous amounts of wealth, I I'm hard pressed, to, you know, especially when you have this sort of elite that's making money that just has more cosmopolitan outlooks. I'm not sure that even if we were to return to sort of rates of trust in the government that we saw in the 50s and 60s, that that's going to preclude people from taking advantage of these tax havens and whatnot. I mean, to me, I think the much more the much bigger question is whether the rest of the world can uh, can really get their act together. You know, I, I'm skeptical that, I mean, even if the U.S. and other governments really were to crack down on sort of uh, the Bahamas and the Cook Islands and, and these other sort of small nation states that basically have no purpose but to be tax havens, there, there are always just going to be other places that, that pop up or arise uh, that, that function as, as tax havens. And, and that's to say nothing of uh, blockchain and and the potential there. I think the bigger question simply is whether um, the rest of the world can sort of discover or implement the the intangibles that exist in the U.S. and Canada and to a lesser degree in in Europe. You know, can Singapore, or can Hong Kong, or can Mexico City? I mean, can these places become places where sort of wealthy white English speaking people can they move there and and have the kind of day to day uh life that they have and and or can they at least get good enough to the point that you know they're not willing to spend forty or fifty percent uh of their income on taxes for all the other benefits that come in the u s and I think today it's pretty clear that that it it's really hard to replicate the kind of convenience and lifestyle that exists in the U.S. and Canada and Europe. And, and so I think that for, for those people who sort of want to move in the direction of a, a higher tax um, uh, sort of regime in, in the U.S. and the Western world, that's a major factor going in their favor. Um, but, but I think the opportunity is ripe for, for other countries out there if they can get their act together and sort of use tax havens as a development model. Um, that that they could they could drive a lot of capital to their countries relatively quickly.